What's your thoughts on government cover-ups or covert societies attempting to control humanity? Do you believe in ancient astronauts, intergalactic communication, or extraterrestrial visitations? Ever had an experience with disembodied spirits or the paranormal universe? Are these subjects fact or fiction? Each week, Tony and Eddie explore these unbelievable realities and beyond. Exclusively on Truth Be Told. Welcome to Truth Be Told with Tony and Eddie, where we believe an experience becomes truth. I'm your host, Tony Sweet, and joining me now in studio while Eddie Connor is on tour is famed astrologer Rachel Lang and psychic medium Colby Psychic Rebel. Tonight, our esteemed guest is Frank Joseph. Frank is here speaking about our mysterious connection between dolphins and Atlantis. His new book is Our Dolphin Ancestors, where he shares how humans and dolphins are descendants of the same ancient branch of humanity. Another bonus, Frank's explaining how dolphins communicate with other species and how dolphin therapy has miraculous effects on people with autism, cancer, strokes, and even depression. Let's give him a warm welcome to Truth Be Told with Tony and Eddie. Welcome author and researcher Frank Joseph. Frank, welcome back. You know the crowd loves you here. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty scary. <laughs> well, uh, it can change on a dime, you know. <laughs> <That's> oh, <laughs> listen, I know. That's why I leave the door unlocked so I can get out quickly if I have to. Well, uh, good idea. just so you know, since you're on the phone, I'm Tony and Rachel, just so you know her voice. Hello. And then we have Psychic Hello, Rebel. Hello, Rachel. And then Psychic Rebel Colby. Hello. Hello, Colby. Sounds really interesting. Now, uh, so we're going to get started. Now, if... Uh, I'm hearing a little feedback. Are you watching this or? No, okay. no, I'm I'm just sitting here talking. Okay. To you. That's I just want to make sure because I don't want to. I don't want to. If people are, it's the starting. ancient civilization. I know, right? Yeah. It's it's the all dolphins. the spirits. Yeah, the dolphins <laughs> and the and the spirits <laughs> of the. Last time we last time you were here, we were talked about the Atlantis and uh, the Ice Age, and it was so fascinating. That's one reason I wanted to have you back because you're such a great writer, and I wanted to find out. Uh, your book, Our Dolphin Ancestors, Keepers of the of Lost Knowledge and Healing Wisdom. I want to find out what what was it that brought you to write this book? Well, first of all, it's very kind of you to uh, say all those over-generous words, and uh, I'll try to live <laughs> up to them. Okay. Uh, what, what really changed me uh, into uh, something that became obsessed uh, with the dolphins was... Uh, an incident that happened while I was visiting Honduras with my wife back in 2013, December 2013, and I had an opportunity to be in uh, the water with dolphins for the first time. And that's a very common experience. Thousands of people around the world have had the same thing. But I didn't want to go like to a sea aquarium or a sea world or any other horrible exploitation place. So uh, luckily enough, I got a chance to visit a um, marine institute. This was a cetologist's. Um, a uh, working laboratory in which the dolphins are pretty much free to come and go whenever they want, and they're studied yeah. under natural conditions. And Sweet so boy. it was a scientific wow. institute that I was visiting. I figured that'd be that'd be cool. And uh, they allow tourists, dumb tourists like me, to go down there and see <laughs> them once in a while for, for a fee, you know, and they can tell us some things. So I figured, well, this would be kind of cool. I always kind of like dolphins, like a lot of people that knew nothing about them, and except that I knew that they were mammals, that their ancestors had supposedly evolved from a kind of a dog-like creature that uh, went into the sea and wow. became the creature we know today. And therefore, I was expecting uh, not a fish exactly. I was expecting something kind of a canine, some kind of a, a, sea, a sea dog, <laughs> as it were, something like that. <laughs> well, to make a long story short, uh, when this animal came over uh, to the tourists and myself, um... First of all, it's kind of imposing because you're this five or seven hundred pound animal moving at the speed of a uh, torpedo, right. and it opens its m its mouth, and there is eighty eight of these razor sharp teeth that could break me in half like a breadstick. So I kept reassuring myself, well, they're very friendly, um, <laughs> you know, no problem. But the the thing that really uh, changed me though is when I got a chance to to touch it, to pet it, and I knew it wasn't going to be scaly or anything like that. I thought it might be a little slimy, but in fact, it was like uh, touching uh, the uh, warm skin of a, of a human being. I, it just felt like 
I was uh, touching uh, my wife in, in a pool or something. It was very smooth, uh, like almost feminine skin. But that was kind of a surprise. But what really shocked me was when I looked into its eye. Because I was expecting like kind of a dog's eye, something like that. Right. When in fact, I saw a human being looking back at me. This was a very wow, human eye. And not only wow. that, but I felt like I was in the presence of Sir Isaac Newton or Werner von Braun or some incredibly intelligent person. Uh, the eye moved very rapidly, very intelligently. And I felt as though I was being scoped out. That, like all my medical records, my memories, everything about me was being downloaded into this creature. Mm. And afterwards, I got a chance to talk to some of the other tourists who I'd never met before. And they had somewhat similar experiences. They felt that the animal had scoped us out. So uh, it was a, a really terrific experience. And when I got back to our cruise ship, I just ransacked the library there. I had a pretty good one on anything I could find about dolphins. And I read and took notes, and over the next four months, that's about all I did. I just uh, read what I could, and thank God for the Internet, which uh, was able to provide uh, many university uh, websites and where, I, and where I learned about some of the terrific new research that has taken place about dolphins and so much new material that has not been made public simply because there's so much of it, mm -hmm. and I guess it's kind of hard to digest it all, but I uh, decided after taking all these profuse notes on it and learning all this fabulous stuff that, well, the notes sort of systematized themselves into a kind of a book-length manuscript. And what's incredible about it is that I knew nothing about this subject. I was very reluctant to write about it because I don't have any background in marine biology. And yet uh, I felt like I was taking dictation for the next four months. And uh, the book turned out, and I, I read it after I got back from the publisher, and I figured, like, hey, this is a cool book. Who wrote this? I couldn't believe that that I had written all this in a blaze of four months. And so it's very – the whole thing about dolphins, the deeper you get into them, uh, the more bizarre the whole phenomena becomes. And uh, it's it's a life changing experience. So uh, that's a very long answer to a short. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's yeah. great, and I because a lot of people like myself, I have never had the opportunity to be that close to a dolphin, other than at an aquarium or something like that. I w I've always wanted to swim with a dolphin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I was I was thinking that like humans, you know, we sometimes we get attached to a, another human closer than maybe in the next human right next to him. So, you know, we, we have you ever noticed, uh, did you attach yourself more uh, in your research to a certain dolphin or because there's different species of dolphins uh, oh, yes. than others? Yep. Did you did you feel more connected, I guess, to one one or the other? No, I tried not to have any kind of personal connection while I was writing the book because uh, that would have been uh, the loss of my objectivity. Right. I wanted to write the truth about these animals. I was not trying to be avocational. Uh, that's for others to do. I just wanted to write a book not so much about dolphins, but a book about dolphins and people, the relationship between the two. That's what the book really uh, focuses on. And to do that, I wanted to be as uh, objective as possible and uh, subjectivity can get in the way of that sometimes. But you're absolutely right. There are many different, there are at least 51 different species of wow. dolphins, wow. and they vary amongst themselves terrifically. No wow. And you can, uh, okay, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Are all dolphins friendly? Well, you know, it's, uh, that's a good question. None of them are hostile, but some are far more friendly than others, and you can uh, do this by species. Um, you can even extend the species of known dolphins into uh, their related cousins, which are the orca whales. They're not orca whales at all, the killer whales. They're not killer whales, uh, really. They are a form of dolphin. It's all under the heading of cetaceans, which includes porpoises, which are a little bit different, a little dumber, a little slower, uh, and includes also sperm whales. So there's a tremendous variety of, of animals. And of this variety, the spotted dolphins, the... Uh, uh, bottlenose dolphins and the Rizzo's dolphins, which are like white dolphins, they appear to be the smartest mm -hmm. and the ones that really like humanity a lot more than the other species, which seem, sometimes seem uh, indifferent to human beings. Never, never hostile. No, I would say there's no hostility there. 
but uh, there are other the other species of dolphins care uh, a lot less. But the spotted dolphins, the rizzos, and the bottlenose dolphins have this very bizarre, intimate uh, interest in human beings. And these are wild animals. They're not mm. trained. And they have a deep affection and concern about us. Mm. And when I got into the levels of this affection, that they uh, categorize it or classify this affection into three different categories. According to men, women, and children, they behave differently towards these wow. three groups, uh, although in a very favorable way. With men, they enjoy very much cooperating in work. It's often been said that a, a man's life is his work, and apparently uh, that's what the, the dolphins believe, too. The dolphins uh, are involved in, with primitive societies in West Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and in India, primitive fishing societies where the men will go out with their nets and try to catch fish. And in Australia especially, the, uh, the high man uh, amongst the aboriginals has a certain call, sometimes a song, and sometimes a, a telepathic summoning. This is their own, what, what they have to say. I'm talking about the natives of New South Wales. Mm -hmm. And they will summon dolphins, wild dolphins, out of the sea, and the dolphins will, on their own, begin to herd great shoals of fish into the nets of the really? waiting fishermen. And this same procedure is found not only in New South Wales and Australia and New Zealand, but also in Mauritania and West Africa. And, uh, and not so much recently now, but uh, up to about the middle of the 20th century in, in India as well. So there's this working relationship. They seem to love to work with, with men. Mm. Um, and they take pity on men. They take pity on fishermen. <laughs> uh, yeah. and, and this is, is no overstatement. Uh, there is a, uh, an incident in the book which is typical about this one uh, Australian fisherman who went out all day, very unsuccessful in trying to get any catch at all. He got absolutely nothing, and he felt very despairing about it. He didn't see any dolphins. He didn't see any fish, nothing at all. And he's tying up his boat after all these hours at sea, and he looks down around his ankles, and here's this great, luscious fish just waiting to be picked up, and it's being pushed towards him by a pair of dolphins. Aww. So they're saying, here, we feel sorry for you. Here's, gonna, here's a fish for we're you. We're going to throw you a bone. Right, right. And, and, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's typical. And with women, uh, dolphins take a deep interest in uh, women's reproductive capacities, and I bring out a lot of uh, really interesting anecdotal information about the more than anecdotal information about how the dolphins are very much interested in human female pregnancy and in uh, their reproductive uh, capacity. Now, now, when the, you say interested, in, what what does that mean? Like, do I mean, are they like a dog uh, and sniff a crotch? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, How's that no, working? Uh, they take it far more seriously. Okay. Uh, I, again, the best way to explain <laughs> this, I think, rather than just the, uh, theory, is to uh, real life incidents. Okay. Uh, there was a woman in uh, Florida uh, back in the later part of the last century who was with a group of tourists uh, walking on a pier. And uh, this dolphin appeared, a wild dolphin appeared, and would, uh, and they, they can do very bizarre things like this. And this dolphin just appeared and had a small pebble at the end of its snout, which it tossed with great dexterity and accuracy at this woman's stomach. And uh, so the other tourists saw this and said, wow, we've never seen anything like that before. And the dolphin dove down, came up with a pebble on its snout and tossed it again. It hit the woman's <laughs> tummy with this little pebble. And uh, so it was, a, <laughs> it was a great joke. I thought, well, I never, what's going on here? And after this had happened about half a dozen times, the woman said, well, that dolphin knows something the rest of you don't. I'm pregnant. Wow. And the, wow. So the dolphin probably, rather than telepathically, probably sonically scanned this woman and determined that she was pregnant. But nonetheless, the dolphin took that kind of a whimsical interest uh, letting the uh, woman know, see, I, I know that uh, you're a carrying, you know. And yeah. It's, it's uh, amazing, uh, well, just you an amazing relationship. That you is, definitely can't beat that kind of a uh, announcement, can you? Right, I right, mean, right. everyone's trying to get creative with how they announce they're pregnant, <laughs> right. but uh, dolphin. the dolphin just calls you out. <laughs> <laughs> and the relationship with children is is easy to understand. 
because uh, what's the the big goal in a child's life? It's to have as much fun as possible, yeah. and uh, that's the philosophy of the dolphins, apparently, which is if you can't have fun doing it, don't do it at all. So the dolphins love to play with children, and the, the play involved is of a very intimate nature and actually gets a little scary, uh, not because the children are ever in danger. I've never come across any indication of a dolphin that ever deliberately harmed uh, a child. Sometimes uh, when kids take rides on the backs of dolphins, they will fall off and they'll get drowned. That does wow. happen again, very rarely. Wow. And when that has happened, there have been numerous incidents where the dolphin goes into such deep mourning oh, that the dolphin no. dies. Oh, uh, no. There have, oh, sure uh, they they fall in <laughs> love with <laughs> us to such a degree wow. that if, if uh, there's a tragic situation of some kind, wow. they will uh, c- uh, commit a kind of suicide. Mm. Um, Dr. Um, uh, Lilly, who did the most uh, thorough research into dolphins in the 1950s and 60s, um, was involved in a oh. rather scandalous incident yes. in which one of his assistants, a yes. female, uh, was having a uh, sexual relationship yes, she was. with a dolphin. I, do you know? And, I know this from a podcast, I have to tell you. Oh, okay. And they, they, they did it, um, they kept them... Um, uh, like it, I don't know if it was a, a hotel. It was really weird, right? Where she had a bed or something, even in this, and and she slept yeah. with the dolphin. And, uh, and no, I don't think she slept with the dolphin. Uh, we don't want to get into too many X-rated details here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but she was doing uh, but, uh, research, right? We do mention it in the book. We no. get away with it in the book, but over the air, it was. It was uh, a little kinky, but uh, not that. No, no, I meant uh, she. Uh, but, she had uh, a the bed. The dolphin obviously enjoyed it immensely. And uh, the woman, when she was questioned, uh, she tried to back down on it and saying, oh, well, it was not uh, pleasurable for her. But it would indicate that uh, there was a, an, ex- an exchange of affection, put it that way. Yeah, I think Colby I meant, meant – go ahead, she, Colby. She, I, I, from the podcast I heard, it, what I meant is she had a bed. It, she she – it's not sleeping with the dog. She slept not in a bed. Good. Yeah. Oh they, yeah. They, yeah. Uh-huh. She had a bed in yeah. this with the water and everything. Is from what the podcast said. They had them in the same area. Wow. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's right. That's yeah. right. She lived with the dolphin yes. for a very long time. Yes. And uh, when this liaison was discovered by Dr. Lilly, um, he uh, broke it up. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, so the the dolphin uh, that had had this relationship with uh, this woman. Uh, was separated, and the dolphin went into such uh, deep mourning uh, and, and sadness that uh, they, they could not uh, in any way help this animal, and the animal died of, literally of a broken heart because wow. it was separated from this woman. Wow. And uh, there are many strange stories like this. Uh, going way back to ancient Greece, uh, mm. there's a story of a... Uh, well attested one actually doesn't seem to be mythical rather than a report of this one boy a 12 year old boy who uh, used to love to play with this one particular dolphin this was common then actually it's relatively common now he used to love to play with this dolphin and developed a very close relationship with it and used to ride around on its back commonly enough it was seen by many people no this come to think of it this was Pliny the Elder who was writing about that one of Rome's greatest historians so a pretty good source And uh, one day, the boy on the dolphin, it's a classic theme throughout ancient Greece, of course, the boy on the dolphin, they took off, went way across the sea, they went out of sight of land, and they were gone for the better part of a day. And so everyone thought, well, that's the end of that kid. He's he's drowned. He will never come back. And that's what happened. But then towards the end of the day, lo and behold, the dolphin shows up with the... And... uh, he was perfectly fine, no problem at all, and uh, he seemed very happy, very content, and uh, so his parents and uh, elders, they asked him what had happened, and he refused to say. He said that the, the, the knowledge or the information imparted to him was of a sacred nature wow. and uh, could not oh be God. discussed in uh, profane circumstances, and that supposedly is the origin of a cult. Uh, it was the cult of the Dolphin Mysteries that the Greeks were involved in. Now, the Greeks were hardly fools, you know. They're the inventors of our science and our ethics and everything else. Uh, not everything else, but many other things, many many uh, modes of thought. And the dolphin trees supposedly was information shared 
by the dolphins uh, with select uh, individuals, and that if you were initiated into this cult, it was uh, kind of a life-changing thing. It's related to the Delphic Mysteries, Mm -hmm. very closely related to the Delphic Mysteries, where a woman, a young woman, uh, would be selected for her psychic abilities. Oh, this and, is an uh, oracle of would Delphi. Be, yeah. Yeah. That's right. She's the Pythia. You know? yes. And even the, even the name Do, uh, Delphic, the Delphic Mysteries, comes from the Greek word for dolphin, mm-hmm. Delphi. Mm-hmm. And um, so there's, uh, there's some lost connection that human yeah. beings were f- finally beginning to reestablish in this very high culture of Athens. And then, of course, when the fall of the ancient world came about, all that was... Uh, demonized. It was all, all the information was destroyed as being de- as being work of the devil and so forth. And unfortunately, all that was lost. And now science is beginning to uh, recover some of this uh, very f- fascinating, uh, intimate, and very mysterious relationship that uh, we have with these creatures. Hey, f- hey, Frank. Well, oh, go ahead. Well, what's really fascinating with that, Frank, is um, one of my really, really amazing friends is a shaman. And uh, she did this thing, and she would keep telling me, I'm from Atlantis. I had a life in Atlantis. I'm, like, huge with the dolphins. So it is, like, so nice to hear you talk about that. I'm like, okay, I have to learn more about this because yeah. this is fascinating. I think the best way to really learn about things on a spiritual nature of this kind is not by reading my book. I think the best way is to, as, as I'm sure you realize this, is just through inner meditation, that's yeah, all. I think yeah. that if we have a guided meditation in that direction, uh, things will come to us. You don't, you don't have to go through rituals or memorize the book or anything like that. You just uh, open yourselves up, I think, internally. And I've done that, and mm-hmm. uh, it's been a, a gratifying and... and uh, very uh, life-changing uh, experience, to be sure. Now, Frank, you've written several other books about Atlantis and Lemuria, and I'm probably saying that right, wrong, but you've written uh, about lost civilizations. Does did did some of that that well? First of all, did you did you discover a lot of information through the meditative process and uh, as you were writing those books? Well, I quite honestly, I think that the meditative process that I had was in just in this blaze of interest that I had. I felt that uh, information was just coming to me from out of nowhere. Yeah. I, it was almost effortless. Uh, I, I didn't have to, I don't know how to explain it otherwise than just the passion of writing about this uh, opened up uh, things that uh, were not available otherwise. I didn't go through a guided meditation. No, I was too busy trying to get this book done. <laughs> but it was not, it, it was not a, a labor even of love. It was just a, a kind of a blaze of obsession. And like I say, if I read it now, it's, it's like yeah, I don't you... even recognize having written it. That's, that's my feeling. Do you, feel like, like you do, you, do you feel like you channeled it? Pardon me? Do you feel like it was just channeled through you? It's very possible, yeah. and it wasn't anything deliberate. I just set out to find out more information, but as it came, uh, well, we had some strange things uh, when my wife and I were uh, visiting the Stanley Hotel, for example, oh. uh, in Colorado, and uh, I was working on the book at that time. It was a vacation for us, but nonetheless, one's mind is still turning all the time, and I was out there uh, just enjoying ourselves, and we just had a photograph taken of us by... Uh, some other person visiting the the hotel. And when the photograph came back, we were shocked because in the photograph are these sort of ghostly dolphin figures shooting through the photograph. And I examined the rest of the the roll of film, and there's nothing like that on there at all. Mm. Could be an anomaly of some kind, but why would it form into these dolphin shapes, you know, just at the time that all this is going on? So... uh, I don't know what to think, yeah, yeah. <laughs> spirits or what, you know. But yeah. there, there is no doubt that the dolphins themselves, regardless of anything that I may or may not have gone through, that the dolphins themselves are definitely a mystical animal. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, they are able to. Here are these creatures that live in the vastness of the ocean. They're wild animals, and yet somebody will be in trouble, say from a shipwreck or sharks. Mm-hmm. And these creatures will come out of nowhere and mm-hmm. save this person. And that is common. It has happened for thousands of years. It's happening right now. And there are innumerable... Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I think we've, oh. uh, 
Uh, Cut out for a second. Yeah. Did we lose you? Did we lose you? <laughs> <laughs> but it's still, it's really incredible, don't you think? Like, um, oh, yeah. You, you know, and this connection. So I like that in the beginning, he's talking about, hey, a dolphin is kind of like the dog. And I'm like, that's so, I mean, I wonder if we just had thought of it that way, you know, mm. like helping yeah. it. Oh, there he is. No, he's back. He's, he's back. back. All right, go ahead and finish your thought because you cut out there for a second. No, no, I'm I'm okay. Oh no no <laughs> no! On are you, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, okay. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, well, you know, one thing I was going to ask. We went back to the Greek times, but you in your book you you say you explore the connection between dolphins and Atlantis. So. It sounds like, uh, like you said, they've been around in, in every civilization, at least the ones that are closest to the ocean or t- to the water. But what was the connection with Atlantis? How did, how did you connect the two? Well, uh, Plato, who is still the greatest source for the information that we have about Atlantis, describes their holy of holies, the most sacred place in this great capital of Atlantis, as being the Temple of Poseidon. And they worshipped Poseidon, not just because he was the god of the sea. You know, there's the esoteric and then there's the exoteric side of the gods. And when Poseidon was worshipped by the common man as the sea god, well, he provides fish and everything else and safety and so on. But uh, for the adepts, they could see that Poseidon signified the sea, conscious and the conscious mind. You look at the face of the sea, and it reflects back to you what you what you are. But just beneath the surface are all these dynamic energies, just like the subconscious mind. So it was a quite an involved uh, concept. And the statue of Poseidon, as described by Plato, was surrounded by 100 dolphins. Hmm. Uh, and there were these uh, maidens riding on, its, on their backs. And the dolphin theme is shot through Plato's account. Uh, it's, it occurs at very Atlantean sites that still exist around the world. I'm thinking most specifically at the island of Delos in the center of the Aegean Sea, where there is a called the Temple of the Dolphins. I visited this spot some years ago. Uh, difficult to get to, certainly worth it. And in the Temple of the Dolphins, on the sacred island of Delos, there is a beautiful mural, a mosaic mural, on the floor, which still survives, mostly intact. And it is a beautiful representation of nothing less than Atlantis herself, with her concentric rings of land and moats of water, the same numerical configuration. And um, so I feel that the dolphins played a major role in Atlantean thinking in that they were the originators of these dolphin mysteries, mm-hmm. and that the Greeks inherited them um, and perpetuated them into classical times. I think that is, explains it to a large degree why the Atlanteans had this highly advanced uh, spirituality, um, because they were so in touch with the natural world. And uh, as the greatest ambassadors of the nat- of the natural world, I, I can't imagine anyone higher or greater than the dolphins. That's for sure. Um, how did um, so after writing this book? D- do you feel that your life changed at all? Not from the writing of the book, but from the information that you learned. Do, do you absolutely? Look, yeah, absolutely. I, it answered a great many uh, questions uh, mm-hmm. that I had been wondering and about f- for most of my life, and. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, what really helped me to understand these questions was the study of dolphin evolution, which we now know that not all cetaceans and not even all dolphins are evolved from the same ancestor. Uh, like the, the whales, for example, they do appear to have evolved, as evolutionary scientists tell us, uh, from a kind of a canine or wolf-like creature. That's, That's correct. That's so fascinating. But, yeah. But but not the not the spotted dolphins or the bottlenose dolphins or the rizzo's dolphins. They are radically different than these other species. And I this is the this is the radical uh, belief. I mean, which could really get me in trouble. And I even hesitate to talk about it. But um, you really need to read the book, I suppose, because you need a, a, a deeper argument than I'm able to give here. But in effect, in a nutshell, I believe that those dolphins, the bottlenose dolphin and the spotted dolphins, uh, they share a, a common human 
origin with us. I believe that our ancestors... Oh, right in the good oh, stuff. No, right in the good no, stuff. No, no. It's so <laughs> controversial. I know. Here, it's like yeah. time out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> time out. Let's him digest I, I really this. Believe it. Oh. Yeah. So, so, so what was I, it? Yeah. The, yeah, say that again. The reason you why, cut out. basically, it seems to be the case is because uh, about three million years ago, our primate ancestors who had descended out of the trees were trying to make a living of it in the savanna in East Africa. And they were pretty successful at it except when major flooding took place. And we know this, this happened. This is, this is not theory. Right. Yeah, and that yeah. much of East Africa went yeah. under the sea. And as this encroaching sea level began to take away our ancestors' habitat, they were forced with the same kind of a challenge that nature has given to many other species, adapt or die. Mm. And those species that do not successfully adapt, they become extinct, and nature doesn't care. So we were thrown back on our resources. We had to adapt to this our ancestors had to adapt to these watery conditions, and we developed sea mammal traits, which you and I still carry around with us. And just look at the uh, flap of skin between your thumb and your index finger for one reason. For one example, that is a, a, a flap of skin that does not appear on other primates. It's not found on our supposed nearest relatives, the chimpanzees. This is the remains of a, a web that our fingers and toes were once webbed, and that today there is a condition known as syndactyly, in which 7% of girls and 9% of boys have webbed uh, webs between their fingers and toes. My uh, and this cousin is has an, an evolutionary feet. carryover from the time yeah. that we were evolving into sea mammals. Mm. Oh. The ancestors of the dolphins were faced, in other words, our ancestors were faced with the same condition. They decided to follow their evolutionary destiny into the sea, and they became what they are today. Our ancestors were now faced with a different, our population was faced with a different, similar condition. Because now the seas began to retreat and came back again. So our ancestors decided not to go into the sea, but to return to the land with mm. some sea mammalian traits. Mm. This is known as the aquatic ape hypothesis, or the aquatic ape theory, which has gained a lot of uh, credence over the years, and a lot of support uh, by Desmond Morris and uh, Richard Attenborough and uh, some pretty powerful thinkers. Mm. And so our species has been thrown back and forth over the millions of years between the land and the water. And each time our species has gone into the water, we've developed more of these sea mammalian traits, and we're thrown back on the land again. We are a, a conflicted hybrid species. We are part primate, and we are part cetacean. We are part um, dolphin and part killer chimp. And I think that this um, indicates why we are such conflicted species. Human beings are able to do great godlike things. We can send the Hubble space telescope far beyond our planet. We, our our uh, tremendous research in, in medicine and our, our human kindness on an individual, although it's all rather godlike, and yet we are also the cruelest species on Earth, and we are the most defective species on Earth because we destroy the very life principles that brought us into existence and all other life. So we are a troubled hybrid species, and that's because we are both of the land and of the sea. And the dolphins have not forgotten this. Mm -hmm. And I think that is part of their agenda, perhaps, if they have such a thing, is to reestablish that rapport uh, between them and us that was lost. I believe that they are human beings in dolphin suits, basically. <laughs> With a little more advanced spiritually. I mean... I think there are... <laughs> advanced in many ways. Yeah. You know, we, we pride ourselves on our great civilization and our great material culture, but I think to the dolphins, they would regard all this as crutches. Mm -hmm. You know, they've gone beyond the need for uh, all this technology, which we find so valorous. You right. know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, their, their sheer intellect. Well, to underscore what I, I've been saying, uh, when I was writing the book, I came across an extremely important uh, photograph that really did changed the whole course of, of my work and, and probably my, my life. And this photograph was taken by Dr. Hans Thewissen, who is a pioneer photographer in uh, microbiological uh, photography. And he took this splendid photograph uh, of a dolphin embryo. And this dolphin embryo, which I've reproduced in the book, 
it shows uh, a creature that has toes, has feet, has ankles, calves, knees, thighs, hips, uh, virtually identical to human being embryo, even a, a chest cavity. Mm. It's only when you get to the head that you begin to see a larger brain at work. So you, it's like you're looking at uh, the embryo of an alien, a space alien or something. It has elbows, has forearm, has hand with uh, webbed fingers. All these traits, these human traits, are uh, quite um, visible in the dolphin embryo, but as the dolphin matures, these traits uh, are phased out and it, it assumes more of its marine configuration. Mm. So I think that what we're looking at are remnants, vestiges of a shared evolution between uh, the dolphins and ourselves. Well, we only, we actually, we have about six minutes left, and I can't believe this time is going so fast, and, and this is so fascinating. And I know a lot of people out there that, that are, le I'm learning so much from just yeah, listening me to too. you. Uh, but one, one thing that I, I want to talk about before we go is how you said you explored dolphin communication and the how dolphin therapy. Uh, and how it does affect, because I have a niece that's autistic, and you know, we all know somebody that's had a stroke or cancer and definitely depression. So how does a dolphin, and how can a dolphin affect more or less the, the cancer? Because you know, depression I can understand, but like cancer and aut autism, how does, how, does, how, does that, uh, how does that work? I think the basis for dolphin healing is uh, empathy. Uh, they have a tremendous deep empathy, and if you have that uh, spur uh, to uh, vitalize all your other potentials, then things can work. Right. As regards cancer, uh, again, I can give you uh, an anecdotal uh, story, but again, a typical one, there are many others like it, of a woman who was in the water with dolphins, and uh, the dolphin uh, apparently hit her or bruised her, uh, with its snout, but they didn't really see the animal do that. And this is very rare for anything like this to happen. The woman was not badly hurt, but she did receive a bruise. It turned out later on that this bruise was caused by the dolphin able to zap her with a high-pitched sonar signal. Mm. And so she went to the, the doctor, and the doctor examined her and found that with the bruise was nothing to, to speak of. But the... Oh! No! no. Oh. no. Oh, is that but that she was story? miraculously healed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll finish the story. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, well, hopefully he'll come well, back. Well, that's in actually a uh, perfect. I wonder if that's in the book because that yeah, would be. Yeah. Now we get like that's a, a good teaser. Story. We got a good right. cliffhanger. <laughs> I know. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Frankie, there. Oh, oh my no. goodness! Oh my goodness! I can't believe we can't. Well, we what's can't. the title of the book again? Well, the title of the book is. Oh, oh go ahead. He's back. No, it's just called Our Dolphin Ancestors. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, but we didn't get to hear the result because you cut out. So we didn't get to hear the result after the doctor saw the patient. So could you tell this one well, more they, time? They, <laughs> yeah, the doctor saw that there was, in fact, a tumor growing in her uh. that had been totally unsuspected, that the tumor was, uh, had been rendered freshly benign. In other words, oh, wow. Uh, wow. the dolphin had zeroed in on this woman and had given it a sonic impulse strong enough to uh, terminate the uh, cancer that was growing in her. Wow. Oh, that's incredible. Wow. That is so incredible. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, this does make uh, make you look uh, at our society and say mm -hmm. that there is hope because of, and that's why it's so important that we mm -hmm. keep uh, dolphins and, and whales and all the species out yeah. there that, that are benefiting us. And like I said, we can go, we, humanity could disappear off yeah. the face of the earth. They'll, they'll thrive. If they're gone, but, we're gone. And so I think this is just shows you that we really need to wake up. And I'm hoping, mm -hmm. you know, animals and people like yourself writing books about this that will really help us, you know, promote and help. Uh, educate. Educate uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in the survival of all these species. Mm. So. Well, I, I just completely underscore every word you said. And I don't know if it's education so much, but it's appreciation. And that's why I, I've loaded so much anecdotal material in there. I, I want to humanize this uh, question as much as possible so that people can, can feel deeply about it. Right. And there are some, I think there's some moving stories in there of uh, children especially who have had very, autistic children who have had very difficult times and who have been helped immeasurably, their lives changed by just mere contact with dolphins. Well, Frank, as always, you uh, 
blew us away with your stories, with your research, and we want to thank you for writing the book, Our Dolphin uh, our dolphin ancestors, keepers of the uh, lost knowledge and healing wisdom. And again, thank you so much for joining us again. This was well, a thank great... you. I, wish I would have liked to have heard more uh, from uh, my hosts, but uh, oh, well, please. maybe next time. <laughs> please. No, no, you, thank, you, yeah, thank you. This was all about you. Like <laughs> yeah. I said, we're just here to look pretty. Right. Uh, <laughs> but thank you so much, and we'll see you next time. I know you're going to. Oh, do you have any uh, books that you're going to be writing here soon or anything like that? Well, this is a pretty hard one to follow. I'm I back to archaeology again because okay. that's what I know about. <laughs> right. But yeah. uh, I, I blew it all, everything I knew on the dolphins. That's that's all I can say about it. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much. Frank Joseph, everybody. And we'll talk to you soon, Frank. Okay. Keep in touch. You okay, bet. We night. will. We will. Bye-bye. All right, everybody, it's time for us to say goodbye to all our company. Uh, Rachel, thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. And again, tell everybody how to get a hold of you. Listenup.com or Rachel, the letter C, Lang, L-A-N-G.com. Colby? Yeah, PsychicRebel.com. And this has been fantastic. I know. And we miss so Eddie. So much fun. We miss I Eddie. Know, we miss I hope Eddie. we did him proud. I know. Oh. I love it too. Yeah. I'm sure he's going to be very, very proud of you guys. But and thank I you. am too. And so one more time, tell us uh, about the upcoming event that you're going to be at. The- yeah, tomorrow night. It's a uh, public mediumship demonstration. It's in Los Angeles with one of the greatest uh, British mediums of all time, Mavis Patilla. And it's Melinda Kushner and myself so you get three mediums for the price of one (laughs) and uh yeah space is limited but if they go to psychicrebel.com and go to events they can uh find the tickets there perfect thank you well thank you ladies and uh john you didn't say much today no i was i was just listening taking it all in Yeah. yeah All right. Well, he was giving us the good vibes. That's yeah. right. That's right. And we want to thank everybody that called in from the first hour. Mm-hmm. We appreciate it. Uh, we uh, hope you go to truthbetoldwebtv.com. Check out n- next week's guest. We have some great guests coming up. Uh, and then go to our YouTube channel, uh, Truth Be Told with Tony and Eddie. Please subscribe. Leave us a comment. We'd love that. Listen to us on iHeartRadio. And uh, thank you guys for downloading. We appreciate it so, so much. All right. Till next time, we're out. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye.